Thank you all for joining us here in the bright and foggy Richmond district of San Francisco. It's so great to be here. This past weekend, San Francisco really was bumping. I don't know about you, but I was all over the city and I saw people everywhere. Whether they were going to Chase Center to see preseason of the Warriors where we beat the Lakers, we were really excited about that, or where they went to Oracle, uh, where the Giants were playing the Dodgers, and yes, we might have had a setback with one of those games, but we pulled it off last night, so I'm really excited to see what happens tonight. We saw the Blue Angels fly all over San Francisco and do one of the most magnificent air shows I've seen in a really, really long time. The Italian Heritage Parade, it was packed in North Beach with so many people and so many businesses. Our hotels were full. So much going on in San Francisco. It was really great. And we just announced that one of the first cruise ships uh, that we've seen since the pandemic started has returned. So when you think about the fact that we're still living in a pandemic, because 83% of San Franciscans are vaccinated and we're starting to see lower number of infection rates, that has everything to do with why we have been able to make really great decisions and continue to reopen our city. And so I'm really excited about that, and I just can't wait until we continue down that road. We are well on our way to a real serious economic recovery, and also I'm just so happy to see people out and about in our city. But during this pandemic, it wasn't the only challenge that continued to persist. All of those issues that we faced before this pandemic still continues. And one of the biggest issues has everything to do with housing and affordability. When I talk about housing and how important it is to move forward aggressively to get more housing built, it has everything to do with growing up in San Francisco and watching it become less and less affordable, watching friends and family move out of San Francisco people making decisions about whether or not to have children because of affordability. And when I think about my life growing up in San Francisco, yes, there were challenges, but this is an amazing city and there's no other place I'd rather be than in San Francisco. But also, I want to make sure that we are sharing in those opportunities. I've talked to so many people in this community in particular, and the conversation I have with them when I was first running for mayor Scott Weiner had this bill, SB 827, that I think most people on the west side was completely adamantly opposed to. And the conversation I would constantly have is, well, how long have you been here? They were mostly born and raised here, here for 40, 50 years. They raised their children here in the same house. They still live there. But when I asked where their children live now, their children who were adults and sometimes married with their own kids, Oftentimes, they were not living in San Francisco because they couldn't afford to live here. Because we have not done our part in ensuring that we build housing equitably, geographically, around our entire city. And that's what today is about. It's about looking at opportunities. No, we're not trying to make the west side of town into downtown. But what we're saying is, with underutilized places like this place that used to be a gas station, there could be the possibility to create four stories with Gus's Market. This is possible in underutilized spaces, an incredible addition to this community. It is important that we get rid of the bureaucracy, we get rid of the layers, and we look at being innovative and make it easier to build housing. It should not take 10, 15 years once a property is available to build. We have over 70,000 units that have been approved in the planning department. And Rich Hillis, our director of planning, is here with us today. And he can tell you he's been working overtime to come up with solutions to get rid of the bureaucracy so that we can get those units online. But it's going to require a lot more. And today, we're announcing a new piece of legislation that will help us get there. 
called Cars to Casa. To Casas or Casa? Well, Casas, Casa, Mi Casa, Su Casa. <laughs> cars to Casas. And the whole point is taking underutilized spaces like gas stations that are closed, like garages and parking lots, places that aren't realizing their full potential and moving forward with allowing them to be zoned to build housing. That's what we're doing here today. And we have a number of folks who truly support this and, and especially I want to also recognize the environmental impacts of what happens when you build more housing in a city. People are moving further out, they're commuting further from the city, the freeways are packed, the cars, the congestion. When you build housing near transit corridors around public transportation, that's how you help with the environment too. So it's so many things that this will do, affordability, helping the environment, and making sure that generations of San Franciscans who love this city, who want to continue to call this city home, and people who want to raise their children here can afford to live here. That's what building more housing means, a better future. And I want to thank all the folks who are joining us here today. In addition, we have the folks from Yembe, Laura Foote will talk in just a little bit. We also have Todd David, and from the Housing Action Coalition and another person from Brightline, folks who really care about moving the bureaucracy out of the way, moving the politics out of the way, moving the drama out of the way, because we care about not only making sure we can continue to afford to live here, we want to make sure the next generation doesn't continue to deal with the challenges of affordability as it relates to housing in San Francisco, and that's what's most important. Now with that, I'd like to introduce someone who, as I said earlier, he's really been a champion and unapologetic about pushing the envelope to get more housing built everywhere. Now I don't know about you, but I don't see a four-story building as a high-rise, and I don't think it's unreasonable to ask to build something like this in areas where we desperately need housing, and of course, a great supermarket to add. State Senator Scott Weiner has worked on legislation to try and make it easier to build more housing, more density in places where there is robust transit. And he's willing to push the envelope because he understands the importance of not just transit, but in the environment and how housing plays a role in all of those things. And so we appreciate his work and advocacy in Sacramento. So with that, I'd like to introduce State Senator Scott Weiner. Thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, and thank you for your leadership on, uh, on housing. Uh, so we're working very hard um, at the state level to encourage and sometimes to require uh, uh, cities to allow more housing. Uh, we have cities throughout the state that unfortunately uh, many of them have just not allowed very much housing at all over time or have made it just uh, just impossible to actually get anything built. And so we're trying to reset the rules at the state level to say that all cities must participate, that we need housing everywhere. This is about the future of our state. Uh, but it is fantastic when we have cities, and there are more than you would think, and San Francisco is one of them, uh, and Mayor Breed uh, is certainly leading the way here. It's fantastic when cities, without being told you have to do it, to do the right thing and acknowledge that if we're serious about having a future for young people in our city, that if we're serious uh, about having a city that can be diverse because people can afford housing, that if we're serious about tackling poverty and homelessness, then we should be creative in finding ways to allow uh, more housing. Uh, and it's fantastic uh, that the mayor is proposing uh, this very, very creative approach where we know that we have so many auto uses in San Francisco that are sometimes closing down, gas stations, car washes, uh, and so forth, uh, where we could put a lot of housing uh, in areas that are in our neighborhoods, 
uh, with uh, mixed use, with these wonderful commercial uses, near transit, uh, near jobs, in all parts of the city. Uh, and it's also about equity. Uh, we have historically put our, uh, focus our housing in a, just a few small parts of the city. We need to have housing everywhere. People on the west side also uh, need more housing. Uh, what I will also say is uh, the mayor talked about SB 827, uh, which was our um, allowing uh, more density near transit uh, that we proposed a few years ago. Uh, and, and actually, um, you know, the mayor during her campaign very bravely supported that legislation. She was the only candidate who did. Well, it turned out in the polling, uh, not only did she win, but the polling showed that despite some very loud voices that you hear that can sometimes seem like they represent the majority, the people who oppose all housing, who don't want any change, who show up and spend 10 hours of planning commission uh, hearings and make it seem like they're the majority, they're not. When you look at the polling, people in San Francisco, including people on the west side, understand that we need more housing, want more housing, understand that this is about the future of the city, want to make sure their kids have a place to live, and are willing to accept more housing in their own neighborhood. The people get it. Uh, the politicians need to catch up. Uh, I want to thank the mayor for helping lead the way uh, to catch up. This is a fantastic program, and I fully support it. Uh, I now have the honor of uh, bringing up uh, one of our great uh, housing advocates. Uh, one of the things that has changed over the last decade is we have a deep grassroots movement, uh, the YIMBY movement of people who, uh, want, who just want to say yes uh, and want to make sure that we have enough housing. Uh, so from YIMBY Action, Laura Foote. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. This is so exciting. Um, as an advocate, bills like this offer the really unique opportunity to make progress on multiple of our most intransigent issues. Carsa Casas is going to take steps to make our city more accessible and put that downward pressure on rents. Um, I know we've had this kind of miracle of a moment in the middle of tragedy where rents dipped and they're right back up there and we need to be doing everything we can to be planning for the next generation making our city more inclusive more accessible and building more homes to address our chronic housing shortage Carsa Casas is about green tech retrofitting you might not know this, but the number one thing that San Francisco can be doing to address greenhouse gas emissions is building infill housing. This is going to literally be taking that car-centric infrastructure and making it easier to build the thing that we know will make our city more sustainable. That's homes for the families that are right now, they are searching on Craigslist and they are crying. They are saying, I cannot afford to live in the city that I love. I cannot afford to live near my job. I cannot afford to be close to my family. These bills are making this city more inclusive for the next generation. This is about building back better and it is an incredible opportunity. I am so glad that we have leadership that is willing to take the major steps to address our chronic housing shortage. Um, there's a great Biden quote that says, don't tell me your values, show me your budget. And for local governments, it's actually don't tell me your values, show me your land use policies. You have land, how are you using it? How are you making your city the best that it can be, the most inclusive that it can be? Um, I'm really excited about this and I hope that the Board of Supervisors takes the advantage of what the mayor is putting forward, a bold idea of taking car-centric infrastructure and doing exactly what we know every climate scientist is telling us we need to be doing, which is building infill, walkable communities and getting away from the carbon emitting technologies of the past. Um, thank you so much and I'm going to hand it over to Todd David from Housing Action Coalition. Yeah. It's never fun to follow Laura. Um, so I just want to start by saying like how lucky are we in San Francisco to have such amazing leadership on housing in Mayor London Breed and State Senator Scott Wiener just like two of the most amazing housing champions in the state of California. And so as a, uh, a parent of three teenagers who all want to come back to San Francisco, and I don't want them moving back into my house, I think that uh, we need more housing. Look, we, we all know the 
Housing Action Coalition. We are a uh, member, a member supported nonprofit that supports housing at all levels of affordability. And just like you, we are well aware that San Francisco is experiencing an affordability and displacement crisis that is being primarily caused by an underproduction of housing at all levels of affordability for the last 50 years. Right? And we know that workers, people who work every day, like the key workers, the teachers, the firefighters, the nurses, they are getting pushed further and further and further out of San Francisco. Right? And they have super commutes. They are driving two hours in each direction. And that is contributing to greenhouse gases and to climate change. So it makes sense right, to be looking at where do we have available uh, land to develop and to take car-centric, you know, old-time car-centric pieces of property like gas stations and parking lots and to make it easier for developers to build housing at all levels of affordability that just makes sense in San Francisco we're gonna have workers living closer to the urban centers being able to walk take public transportation right? we're going to be building that next generation of housing making space for my children for your children and your grandchildren and so we really this is something that we should all be coming together and every neighborhood needs to be a part of the solution right and welcoming new neighbors and new personalities into their neighborhood and so this is really exciting and you know cars to casa is super super important piece of legislation i'm not sure that people touched on this one of the main things it's going to do it is going to eliminate a conditional use so conditional uses are things that developers need to get that can sometimes take a year it could delay housing for a year we know environmentally this is the right thing to do. So it should be like, listen, if a developer was willing and wants to build housing on a parking lot or on a gas station, we should say, yeah, let's go forward. Let's eliminate that bureaucracy. Let's bring that housing online faster. So again, I want to thank uh, Mayor London Breed for moving this forward. I want to thank State Senator Scott Wiener for his uh, unyielding, unwavering leadership on this issue at the state level. And it is my pleasure to introduce um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Shu from Brightline, Sarah Shue, sorry, excuse me, Sarah Shue from Brightline Defense. Sorry about that. Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, my name is Sarah Shu from Bright Lane Defense, an environmental justice nonprofit based here in San Francisco. We work on a variety of policy work, uh, issues and programmatic work, including youth leadership, air quality monitoring, and job training. Car Sacasas is the right step uh, to, to move away from our reliance on cars, reduce air and climate pollution, and improve public health. Significant changes in transportation are needed to help achieve our climate goals, such as limiting global temperature increases to 1.5 degrees Celsius or below, and limiting carbon emissions for our city. The city should be moving to transition both gasoline vehicles to cleaner cars and prioritize public transit investments as new development occurs. This policy would make sure that we put our climate future first and deprioritize underutilized gas auto-oriented land. A policy like this also has the ability to advance equitable, cleaner air in San Francisco. Vehicle emissions tend to disproportionately impact low-income communities and households right next to highways. Vehicle emissions can exasperate exacerbate existing conditions like asthma and long-term exposure can increase the frequency of respiratory distress symptoms such as irritation of airway, coughing, uh, or difficulty breathing. By transitioning more land away from auto-oriented uses, this policy can bring a more climate resilient future for the health and safety of all our communities here in San Francisco. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that concludes our um, presentation here today. Um, are there any questions? I, I apologize, Philip. I was just wondering if you could summarize what you're here. I know. I, well, I, I, can you summarize what you're, what you're saying today? So, what we're doing is we I am introducing legislation called Cars to Casas, where the legislation will allow for us to remove the conditional use process 
to speed up the ability to zone properties like this one that used to be a gas station. Um, we'll be able to use places that are garages, gas stations, parking lots, um, car washes and things that mostly served and were um, zoned for car related uses and would allow for us to move forward faster in the process to build housing rather than go through an additional layer to remove a bureaucratic layer that could add anywhere from you know 12 to 18 months to the process. So, uh, pardon me, how is it going to streamline this process? What does it actually do? It, so it changes the, the It changes the, the zoning or, of those properties. And it says that they don't have to, they, they can change the They don't need a condition, levels, they, but, they don't need a conditional use. They don't need to go through that additional layer they will be able to uh, skip that entirely. That would be removed entirely from the process. So, for example, um, and I'll, Francis Scott Key, that campus where there was uh, housing that was uh, going to be built for teachers, there was this other additional layer, as you might recall, that added 18 months where you had to change the zoning so that it wasn't zoned just to be used as a school. Um, because that's part of the challenge with our zoning laws. There are places that can only be used for specific purposes, and when you're changing the use of those places, you have to go through a whole nother process in addition to, you know, all the housing-related stuff. If something is already zoned for housing, you don't have to go through that process. And what we're doing is saying the entire city where these auto-related zoning laws exist, we're going to automatically, through this legislation, say, they are going to be automatically eligible if housing is an option and someone wants to build housing, that they don't have to go through this additional layer. That's the best way I can explain it. Rich, you want to add something to it? Sure, I can. You can speak in planning terms. Yeah, so just to add to <clears throat> excuse me, what the mayor said, it, so it, it gets rid of this process, which could take anywhere from six months to 18 months. It also gives project sponsors more flexibility, so allows them to do more units on a parcel like this. Right now it's controlled um, by the lot size on how many units you can do. So it gives flexibility. This project, I think did what, 13 units or 12 units? They're, they're pretty large. So it would give this sponsor the flexibility to do smaller, larger units, get rid of that process and get through the process quicker. All right. Rich, could I have you say and spell your name <clears throat> first and last? Yeah, sorry, H-I-L-L-I-S is my last name. Rich, R-I-C-H, first name. And he's the director of the planning department. All right. Any other questions? Some of the mass rules are changing on Friday. But they are? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> only here in San Francisco and we're and only in certain settings. And not, you know, and we'll have to wait for wider changes around the Bay Area. Do you think people will be confused about what the new rules are? All I got to say is do your best. We are all trying here. It's been a long time. Yeah. Do your best. What was that, the first part? Several Walgreens stores are leaving San Francisco. Yes. Several Walgreens are closing, yes. Um, you know, the sad reality is in what we're facing um, with a number of these crimes is, and, and to be clear, we all saw the person who rolled into a Walgreens in their bike and robbed the store, and that was... That went viral all across the world, but what didn't go viral is the fact that this man has been arrested by the San Francisco Police Department, is behind bars now, and awaiting prosecution. Um, the fact is, these crimes, sadly, are horrible crimes, and they impact the quality of life of our communities. But more importantly, what I want people who commit these crimes to understand, your mother, your grandmother, your relatives, they depend on places like Walgreens and CVS and Targets where they have pharmacies to get their medication. So when these locations close in a community, then the entire community loses. The things that people want the most, of course, in their neighborhoods are grocery stores, pharmacies, hardware stores, places that help support the community. And so part of what has to happen is we all as a city have to come together to, of course, hold perpetrators accountable, but make sure that the investments we're making on the front end never make it possible for these crimes to be committed. The last thing we want to do is see this happen. We've been in touch with many of the retailers in San Francisco. We work with the San Francisco Police Department to revamp our 10B program so that 
These companies can hire off-duty police officers to serve as security at their locations, and we have that happening, and we've redirected them in the locations that are the most problematic. Ultimately, we can't force a company to remain in San Francisco, but we are trying to work with them. And we want to make sure that they are doing a better job strategically around their security systems to ensure that these crimes don't continue to happen. So our door is open. We're continuing to have conversations with them. We're continuing to, our police chief is working with them hand in hand. And as you see, um, the number of robberies uh, with some of these establishments have slowed down considerably. And I think some of the things that we've implemented are working, but you know, they're making the decision to move and that's gonna be problematic for our city. And we'll continue to do what we can to improve the quality of life and safety in our city, and hopefully they'll change their mind and come back. Thanks, everyone. All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.